I love the way people try to describe me. I just get a kick out of hearing guys try to de describe me to their congregation. And the, the wild country pe preacher and country strong and, and everything else. We got, out, we got off the plane. Uh, me and Hope, I'm going to let you sit in just a minute, I promise. Uh, I know everybody's been working and uh, we've, we've actually been going all day too. We kind of took a couple of vacation days. We needed it. But um, we flew in to L.A. If you hadn't done that, don't ever do that. And uh, we decided to take a couple of days and drive up the, the coast because I've always been told about how beautiful a drive it was. <clears throat> and um, as we drove up, your pastors met us and we were able to spend some time with them. And uh, every place that I walk into, as soon as I open my mouth, guess what their first question is? <laughs> I mean, I can't even say, do y'all have a Coke? I mean, when I say, where are you from? You know, so immediately I think everybody knows I'm not a Californian uh, when I speak, but I hope y'all can handle a little bit of this country draw tonight. I got a word for you. And uh, let me tell you, I thank you for coming. I don't know, somebody just open your mouth and give God a big shout. I, I like to stir things up a little bit. Yay! Hey. <laughs> somebody said, what, do you, what are you? I said, I'm kind of like, Spiritual x lax I just like to get things moving. So uh, I believe God's going to do something powerful tonight. Uh, I don't know if I told you about it last time. I got a bad spitting problem. I, I've been known to seven, eight rows deep. I've been known to pinpoint people. So if you want to get under here and the spout where the glory comes out, come on up here. Uh, if you think you're getting away from the spit, sometimes I preach down the aisles. I'll get you all the way back at the back. But uh, I, got, I got a word I want to share with you next few moments. Father, I just ask that you take this night. There, there are people online and people under this roof, and there are all types of situations and needs that are represented. I didn't just come here because I didn't have anything better to do, and Pastor didn't invite me, and these people didn't drive over here in the traffic and the weather because uh, we had no purpose. There is a purpose we are here. And I pray that when we leave tonight, we know exactly why I was invited, why you brought the people that you brought, why you've done what you're going to do. I already see you aligning things and where I'm going to fit in. I thank you that tonight I'm going to preach under the power of the Spirit of God like I've never preached under it before. I thank you that there's going to be a glory manifest in this place, the likes of which we've never seen. I thank you, God, that there's a fresh anointing coming upon Pastor and his wife like this church has never seen. And I call in a multiplication anointing to powerfully manifest itself in the life of each and every person under the sound of my voice. Right now, I just prophesy, God, that there is a multiplication happening in this house right now that no eye has seen or ear heard in the name of Jesus. Now we make our hearts ready for that which you're about to do in Jesus' name. And everybody shouted amen and amen and amen. Turn around before you sit down and tell four people, say, Jesus is why I'm so pretty. Tell them, Jesus, yeah. Well, since I'm from Southern, since I'm from South Carolina, I'm gonna be myself. How y'all doing? Y'all doing all right tonight? Everybody, everybody good? How many of you things are rolling pretty good right now in your life? Things are rolling pretty good. How many of you going through hell? How many of you it's been better? How many of you, well, it's been worse? Okay, okay. I had no idea what you were gonna show up there, Pastor Huggins. I had no idea you was getting ready to go and do a series on Pentecost and the Holy Spirit because I have, I've been at the same church a quarter of a century. We're, we're celebrating 25 years all year this year. Been there, yeah, we started the church 25 years ago. Started the church when I was six, I'm 31. And uh, y'all are good, y'all are good. Y'all good, you caught on quick. Um, started church when I was 22, not smart. Uh, got I graduated Bible school on a Thursday, got married the next Saturday, started church the next Sunday. Wow. 
And so been there 25 years now, I'm 47. And so we're making a big deal out of 25 all year long this year. And a lot of pre preachers have moved to different places. I've been at one place my whole adult life. So I have 2,700 messages in my files. 2,700. So when I go somewhere to speak, you know, where do you even begin? And God had me pull out a teaching for tonight that I have not done in years, and it's about the Holy Spirit. And then you got up and said, you're going to start on the Holy Spirit, and then you got Pastor Huggins going. I looked at him, I shook my head. I said, I was wondering why in the world God laid this message on my heart, because I got so many other things I want to do, but more than that, I just want to obey God tonight, okay? And uh, I believe this is going to be a different angle than maybe what you've been presented uh, before or maybe heard. I'd love to hear what Pastor is going to bring in the, in the coming weeks. I want you to, I'm going to get right in the Word. I don't want to waste much time and invite your friends and come back Friday night. Friday night, I'm going to preach a part right down the middle of your head. Hallelujah. <laughs> I told him, I said, tonight will be a little more content. I may take it a little easier. I said, Friday night, I'm going to turn loose. And I said, I'm going to spit and preach and touch and throw down everything that moves. Hallelujah. I ain't even going to wait for the Holy Ghost to throw you down. I'm going to knock you down on the carpet if I get near you. Hallelujah. So uh, we're going to have a great time these two days. And I thank Pastor and his lovely wife for having me. I count this a privilege. Uh, you know what? I get to come and go. But we thank God for the people that come and stay. Would you just give your pastors a hand? Come on, this, we got to honor them. Hallelujah. Is that an organ? You done found an organ? I was going to try not to preach, and you done gone and found a covered up organ with a blanket wrapped around it back there. If he starts hitting that organ, I'll lose my mind. That's when you find out I'm the only man God ever dipped in the wrong paint. So uh, we're going to have a good time. 1 Corinthians 2. Open your Bible to 1 Corinthians 2. And uh, I'm going to bog down in two scriptures, 1 Corinthians 2 and Ecclesiastes 3. Ecclesiastes probably isn't your top 10 list of Bible books to read, but we're going to bog down in it tonight. <coughs> Give me just a minute to... Uh, work this thing. Let me tell you what I like to do when I get a, a night to teach. Everybody wants me to come preach and preach to paint and, and tear the walls down and everybody's running and jumping and snotting and tossing babies and hitting each other with shoes. And You know, that's kind of what people want me to do when they invite me, but I do have other methods of communication. Uh, so uh, nobody's going to toss a child tonight. Hallelujah. Keep your shoes on. Um, but anyway, uh, God is a God that hides things. The Bible talks about mysteries all the time. I'm going somewhere with this. I'm a line upon a line. I'm going to build a house right here. Okay? The Bible talks about he who dwells in a secret place. Jesus said when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites and try to be seen. Go to a secret place or an inner place. The Bible calls marriage a great mystery. I know you gotta be careful how loud you amen right now, but it, the Bible calls our relationship with Christ a mystery. About six times Jesus referred to the kingdom as a mystery. One time, Jesus taught all day in code. And the disciples said, why do you talk to them in parables and you talk to us plain? And after Jesus had been teaching all day, you know what he told them? He said, I talk to them in parables because I don't want them to know. He said, I teach, but I hide what I'm teaching behind a curtain because I'm not going to let the casual passerby get the things of the kingdom. You're going to have to seek the kingdom. Salvation is easy. The kingdom is hidden. So Jesus hides the kingdom. 
So you go over and over and over again and you got God, got God secret places. Go to your secret room and pray. And those who dwell in the secret place and the mystery of godliness and the kingdom is a mystery. And I'm like, God, why are you hiding all this stuff? There is a reason that God takes things and hides them. It's because God is never going to cast his pearl before swine. And he's never going to give that which is precious to the dogs. So in other words, you can be saved, but there are kingdom things you will never enjoy because he said that that will only come to the seeker. I'm not sure we still know the art of seeking. Now, can I just talk a little bit? Because I'm, I'm one of those preachers that meddle in your stuff a little bit. Is that all right? Come on, wave me on and say, give, you give me permission to meddle. I'm, I'm gonna, I, I like to get in there in your kitchen and closet and start throwing stuff around a little bit. See, I don't know we know how to seek anymore. Where I grew up, I did grow up in those old primitive holiness churches that you see sometime on TV and they look so foreign and so crazy. Well, that was my church. That's what I grew up in. No, they didn't handle snakes, but they handled about everything else. Hallelujah. And I mean to tell you, but it was nothing, it was nothing for us to come together on Sunday night and there would be no preaching. My dad would just say, we're going to come tonight and seek God. If I got up even in my church today, as much as I teach and preach, and I said, we're going to seek God tonight, I may have, I may have 20% of the people show back up. But my dad would say that morning, we're going to seek God tonight. And the same number of people that came that morning would show back up that night. And they'd stay there till whenever. The church that I grew up in, you didn't get to determine when you wanted to leave the altar. The church mothers determined when God was finished. So y'all don't know nothing about that. I'm pre- I mean, you would go, they would decide if you'd been in sin or not, and they'd come get you. And they would pull you down to the altar, and then when you got down here, they'd take your head and push you down. And then after you was trying to get up because you was through and acting like you done prayed on through and you ain't got no problems no more, they'd get you and push you back down. And I mean, they just keep right on praying. And I know that sounds comical, but inside of that was an art of seeking God that I'm not sure we know much about today because there are encounters with God where your value system changes and your priorities change and your passions change and your desires change. And sometime today, I think we pray a prayer, dunk you in water and give you a certificate. But the, but the church that I grew up in, when people got up from the altar, they had met a Jesus that from that point forward, everything had changed. And just like Paul said, I count everything but dung that I may know Christ. He said, every, in other words, everything that was important to me up until now, I count as rubbish now that I've met Jesus. He said, what used to be important is not important anymore. What I used to want, I don't want anymore. What I used to desire, I don't desire anymore. By the way, can we say amen on Wednesday night? Yeah, I want to make sure that you're still here with me. Hallelujah. So you say, when is he going to read the scripture and preach? I'm already preaching. Okay. So I wasn't going to preach tonight either, and I'm already, we got veins coming out my neck, don't I? So I was going to try not to do it tonight. I, that's all I know how to do. But I wanted to talk to you about these mysteries. What are they? Why are they there? And why did God design it that way? Because there are things that are hidden, not from you, they're hidden for you. But we got to learn how to uncover them. All right, I'm going to go line by line through 1 Corinthians 2. Follow with me here. And by the way, these glasses are just for fashion. (laughs) Fashion purposes only. Hallelujah. I'm 31. No eye problems. (laughs) However, we speak... Verse 6, wisdom among those who are mature. (laughs) Yet not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery? What does that even mean? When do I speak wisdom hidden in mysteries? We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages 
for our glory. Now, you ain't going to hear God talk about your glory much. He talks about his glory all the time. But he says there is something hidden that you have to speak, and it's for your glory. Pastor, can I keep pushing? Is this all right? All right, I'm going to keep pushing. All right, you want to hear it? Can I keep going? All right, I'm going to test you out. Which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they had known, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor ever entered the heart of a man, the thing that God has prepared for those that love him. God said, I've got something for you. It is hidden. You must speak it. It is wisdom, but you can't hear it. You can't see it, and your heart's never pondered it. So nobody can teach you, and you cannot learn in church this wisdom I'm talking about because it's shrouded in mystery. All right, here we go. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. Now, information is learned. Okay? So this is not information. Revelation is revealed. So what God has for you, nobody can teach you. Okay? So there is a revelation that has to come from your inner man about your life that is for your glory and your advancement. It's got to come from the inside. If you do not come up, become acquainted with the one who lives inside of you, you will miss your purpose and you will miss your potential. So the fact is, there is wisdom. It's hidden in a mystery. I have to speak it. But no eyes seen, no ears heard. Nobody can teach it to me. But God only himself can reveal it by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Are you following me? Because I want to make sure I'm breaking it down to you. Now, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us. Touch your neighbor on both sides and say, here we go, neighbor, here we go. All right. I can tell I'm about to rip this thing loose right here in the building. Hallelujah. Touch your neighbor and say, you're about to find your purpose tonight. Can I walk around? Can I just be free to walk around? How y'all guys doing back here? Y'all all right? I like to be close to people. Y'all too far away. Y'all didn't take no bath or nothing for church? I don't know why y'all sitting back there all by yourself. Hallelujah. So if I come get close to you, don't get nervous. I, just like, I don't like there to be a lot of distance between me and folks. So, and, and plus, I do like to spit. I think it's helpful every once in a while. Like I, like I told you last time, if it hits you, leave it there. Don't wipe it off. Leave it there. That thing will heal you. That's good stuff. That, that, stuff, will, that stuff will change your life, man. Ecclesiastes 3. Would you throw that on the screen right quick, guys? To everything there's a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. The next verse that I gave you, please. I think it was 11. And then verse 15, I believe that's what it gave you. Ecclesiastes 3, then 11, then verse 15. I'll talk till we get it up there. All right. Look back at me. I'll know when it goes up there because all of y'all won't pay me no attention no more. Y'all start looking up there. Okay. Ecclesiastes 3, one. To everything, there's a time and purpose. Now, let me talk to you about that. There we go. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Stay with me now because this is the part nobody reads. This is after the comma where all the preachers quit reading because they go, it's a time to die, a time to live, a time to cry, a time to laugh. They go through all that and then they quit reading. Let's read past the commas. He has put eternity in their hearts. Except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. I have eternity in my heart, but I do not know what God's going to do from A to Z. I know A, and sometimes God will give me a vision of Z. But you know what you got to watch out for? L-M-N-O-P. Last verse, verse 15, I think it is. 
That which is, that which is has already been and what is to be has already been. I'm about to mess your head up. This is going to be fun. Stay with me right here. We're going to, we're going to tear this thing apart. This is a life-changing message. Hadn't preached it in years, so I'm about to have a good time. I might sew into myself. I brought me $100. If I'm preaching good, I'm going to sew it in my other pocket and keep it. Hallelujah. All right. I forgot what I was going to say now. I had something good too. It was hot. There is a, there is a, there is a perception of God that has to change. We, we perceive that God is walking through time with us. In other words, God is going to wake up tomorrow and be just as surprised about tomorrow as you are. And if it, listen to the way we pray. We pray as if God has no clue what we were about to go through. And it upsets us when we cannot get God upset over what's upsetting us. Because if we panic and we want God to panic. If we are burdened with it, we want God to be burdened with it. If, we, if, it, if it is angering us or it's hurting us, we want God to be just as upset over this thing as we are. And then when we can't get God upset, it makes us more upset. But the fact is, God has already been in your tomorrow. And when God looks at your life, God does not look at your life as he knows what has happened up until now and he wonders what's going to happen tomorrow and he's going to try to help you fix it if it goes bad. That's not the way God's looking at your life. The Bible says what is to God has already been and what is yet to be has already been. In other words, God lives with everything in his rearview mirror. God knows no such thing as future. God doesn't have a future. He says, when you tell Pharaoh what my name is, tell him, I am. Not I was, not I will be. Good God Almighty. I am. And every day he is I am. So you got to understand, he is Alpha, he is Omega, he is beginning, he is in, he is first, he is last, and he's first, last, beginning, in, Alpha, Omega, all at the same time. So God is not getting up tomorrow morning and going through time with you and wondering what's going to happen, and as soon as something hits you sideways, he don't get up and start shaking, you know, just go run his hand through his hair, say, what am I going to do, what am I going to do, what am I going to do? The Bible says when Jesus went back to heaven, he said, it is finished, and he sat down. And you don't have a problem big enough to get him up. Why did he sit down? Because there's nothing left for him to do. Because everything God has ever going to do, he's already done. Now, I don't know what pastor's going to say about this, and if he thinks my theology's off, don't email me, email him. <laughs> okay? I love the prophetic ministry. But there's something that they do that makes me need itch cream. When I hear a prophet speak and God is about to and God is about to and God is about to. And I went and sat on a round table of five of the most well-known prophets. And I was the only one there whose dominant gift was not the prophetic. And they asked me what I think about what's going on. And all I had heard that day was 2,600 God is about to's. And I looked at them and I said, can I tell all y'all something? They said, please. I said, God ain't about to do nothing. I said, God has already done everything he's going to do. I said, and it is finished. I said, you might be about to come into something he's already done. I said, but God is not about to do anything. I said, he said, it is finished. He went to the Father and he sat down. Good God, I'm preaching this thing. So God is not going to get upset tomorrow at what happens to you because God has already provided a way out before you ever got in trouble. God is already more acquainted with your tomorrow than you are your yesterday. 
When God sees your life, he sees your life as a picture that is finished. Other than that, how could your steps be ordered by the Lord? The Bible says that what has been, has been, and what is yet to be to God has been. God views everything past tense. The Bible says those he called, he justified. Those, those he foreknew, he predestined. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. Notice all of it. None of it has to be done. All of it's already been done. So with God, your life is finished. Because God does not live in time. God lives in eternity. God doesn't have a future. God doesn't learn. There's nothing he doesn't know. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? There's not any information that catches him off guard because there's not any time where he doesn't have all the information. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So God in eternity in heaven, your life is finished and God has ordered your steps. And you are not to determine your life, you are to discover it. For the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So what are we doing here? Are you ready for this? Mess your head up, here I go. We are every day in this life slowly becoming what we already are. Wow. Wow. Your mind is trying to catch up with what your spirit already knows. Because in your spirit you have been perfected, but in your mind you are being renewed by the word of God day by day. Every time this man opens his mouth, he is catching you up with what God knows you already are. He is pushing you forward to what you already are. You are becoming what you already are. You are getting closer to what God has already said. Do you understand God is not doing anything, it's already done. You have got to renew your mind because not as your spirit is are you, but as you think. Wherever your mind is, is where you are. That's Friday night, you need to show up for that. You're not where your body is. You're not where your spirit is. You are where your mind is. And until your mind moves, your life don't move. Because anywhere your life's gonna go, your mind's got to move there first. Because as a man thinketh and believeth in his heart, so is that man. The word think is an action verb. The word is is a state of being verb. The way I think defines my state of being. I will always arrive at the place of my thoughts. How did you get there? You thought yourself all the way there. You don't like where you are, change your thoughts. The good thing is, if you ever don't like a destination, you can change your mind and put it in a different direction and your mind will pull you out of that mess and take you into a whole nother direction. Don't like where your marriage is, change your mind. Don't like where your money is, change your mind. Don't like where your attitude is, change your mind. Come on, don't like your family situation, change your mind. Don't like the way your business is being run, change your mind. Wherever your mind goes, your life arrives. So my job is to come to California and help you discover who you already are. Okay? Are we in a good place? Are you with me so far? Now, Jesus came and Jesus self-described himself as the door. Okay? Okay? Is that right if I teach? Okay. He said he was a door. Well, if you come to my house, you don't want to come to my door and stand there three days. You want to come in the house. The goal of Jesus was to deal with the sin so that the kingdom could come. The kingdom is brought into your life by the person of the Holy Spirit. 
That's what the kingdom coming in you. Now, there's a difference, the kingdom coming in you and the kingdom coming in the earth. But the kingdom is within you. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit is coming to you. What did Jesus have to do? Jesus had to deal with the fact that God could not have dual occupancy. So Jesus had to take away the problem because the thing God hated lived inside the thing he loved. And so God sent his son to take the thing he hated out of the thing that he loved so that the thing that he loved could have the thing that he always wanted him to have. So Jesus became sin for us that we might know righteousness. Now that we are in right standing with God, now the Holy Spirit can come. So Jesus dealt with sin, got the sin out of the way, and made us a place worthy of being of holding the Holy Spirit. Now let's move on to the Holy Ghost and we go study these mysteries here. If you're bored, shout amen. amen. All right, I'll, I'll get over it. <laughs> Jesus said, now imagine the disciples, they got Jesus. The living word, walking, eating meals, sharing dusty paths, walking journeys, miracles, signs, wonders, stories, teachings, parables. And Jesus looks at him one day and said, it's better that I go. Now, I'm telling you, that would have been hard for me if I'm like, if I got Jesus right here and he's saying, it, it'll get better if I leave. Because he who is with you shall be in you. You're what, what I'm carrying was not meant for me. It was meant for you. So I had to come deal with your problem so I could get him to you. I'm only here for a little while to show you what it looks like. And then I need to leave because when he gets in you, it'll be better than me being with you. Come on now, I'm walking you through this thing. So he says this, Paul in 1 Corinthians 2. He said, who knows God except the Spirit of God. And who knows a man except the Spirit of a man which is in him? For the Spirit searches all things, yea, even the deep things of God. So now I know we got the Father, we got the Son, and we got the Holy Spirit. And now I'm hearing that the Holy Spirit is the inquisitive one of the Godhead because God has the information about your life and the Holy Spirit wants to get in God's head and find out everything that he can about your life. So who knows God except the Spirit of God? So you come down and then you get filled with the Holy Spirit. Who knows a man except the Spirit of a man which is in him? For the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things. So what happens? The Holy Spirit has gotten in the mind of God and studied your life and he's come out of eternity into time and Jesus said when he comes, he'll be your guide. How can you guide me unless you've already been there? If I want a tour guide, I want somebody who's already toured the place before I got there because he's supposed to know where I need to go. If the Holy Ghost is a guide into your future, then that means he's gotten in God's head and he's toured your future and he's come in time to live inside of you. And he says, no eye has seen. God. No ear has heard, no has it ever entered the heart of a man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him, but it is revealed by the Spirit. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to praise your God. Oh, hallelujah. No eye 
has seen, no ear has heard. But the Holy Ghost says, I know, I know, I know, I know. Hey, high five, three people say the Holy Ghost knows. Tell them the Holy Ghost knows, the Holy Ghost, the Holy. Woo! Thank you, God. This is good preaching. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I feel this thing. Hallelujah. Pay no attention to your watches. I'm on a roll now. Isaiah 46, somewhere around verse 10 says, I'm the Lord God and there's none like me. Knowing the end, in other words, there's none like me. What separates God? He is the only being that knows the end from the beginning. In other words, God starts at the end and works backwards. <laughs> we start at the beginning and don't know the end. God writes your last chapter first and then moves back and makes sure that all things work together. I can't hardly stand it. I'm about to run around this building right now. He writes the end first and then goes back and makes sure that all things work together for the good of those that love God and are called, called, called according to purpose. The purpose that God has predestined for you, God will make sure that everything in your life is working to take you there. The good things, the bad things, the mistakes, the dumb things, the rebellion, the time when you were depressed, the time when you were happy, the things that happened to you, the people that left you, the stuff that walked out on you when you got betrayed, when you went bankrupt, when you lost your credit, when they blessed you, when they cursed you, all things. God will not let any moment of your life be wasted. Some of you that think you've gone too far or you've made too bad a mistake, with God nothing is wasted for these light and momentary afflictions are working for me a far greater weight of glory. Oh, I have come to San Jose to preach to somebody who who needed to know that even though you made a mistake, your end is still intact. Now! Tell your neighbor with confidence, God's gonna do it anyhow. Tell him, he's gonna do it anyhow. Don't care how bad you messed up, he's gonna do it anyhow. God, you have not forfeited your destiny. God has not thrown you to the back of the line. It's still gonna happen. You're still gonna do it. The situations change, the people change, but everything God prepared, you're still gonna do it. Shout hallelujah. Y'all weren't supposed to push me this hard tonight. <laughs> he knows the end from the beginning. In other words, God doesn't start till he's finished. How could Paul say with such confidence, he who has been, who he, he who has began a good work in you will be faithful to, how can he say that with such boldness? Because your God is different from anything and anyone else because he knows the end from the beginning. That means if God has started something in your life, it's already finished. If God has started bringing you out of debt, if God has started repairing the relationship, y'all ain't here. If the tumor has started shrinking, oh God, I feel this thing. 
What God has started, he's already finished because he knows the end from the beginning. And any of you that are in the beginning stages of something, let me come from your future to announce, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. I'm back from the future to tell you, wait till you see what God's gonna do with your life. Somebody give your God a praise in this place. My God, I feel this thing. I feel this thing. I mean, I feel this thing. Who am I talking to? Wave at me. And I feel this thing tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You got to stop. You got to stop. Y'all shout a minute. I need some water. Just turn around and shout. Just look at somebody. Say, he's talking to you. He's talking to you. <laughs> hey! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I'm hitting that crazy level. I feel that wide-eyed look coming in the country preacher. You better be careful. Hallelujah. He knows the end from the beginning. God sees your life in past tense. God looks at your life as a finished, completed picture. You've got to understand that. Sometimes when you don't know why things change, environments change, people change, you've got to understand God already has drawn a picture. God's got to, so if there's a sickness that shows up in your life that's not in the picture. God does not redraw the picture. He gets rid of the sickness. Some of you said, why are they not in my life anymore? Because they wouldn't in the And as hard as you tried to make them work, they weren't a part of the picture. So really, when they went out of your life, you thought people was leaving. People weren't leaving. God was revealing that you were trying to get somebody in your life that ain't in the picture. You know all the people that left, why did they leave? Because they wasn't in the picture. And God ain't gonna redraw the picture to accommodate a disease. He's not gonna redraw the picture to accommodate negative people in your life. He's not gonna redraw the picture for you to be stuck where you are. God's gonna change whatever needs to be changed in your life so that your life looks like the picture that he's drawn. So wherever it is, he's gonna turn it around and he's gonna work it out. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So you got to understand whatever's changing, God is changing it because God is not going to draw the picture. The picture will still take place and it's still intact. Somebody shout amen. amen. Now, <clears throat> the Holy Ghost is my God. He has gone into the mind of the Father. The Father knows everything about me. He's come out of eternity into time and he's, lived in, he's living in me. And now, I have to speak the wisdom of God hidden in a mystery for my glory. Wisdom that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, but only comes through revelation. With wisdom hidden in a mystery. You have a faith 
preaching pastor. He has taught you that for God to move and work, something needs to be spoken. The level to which you speak is the room that God has to work. You have to give God room to work because he works the word, okay? And I know the general word and general will of God for all of us, but I don't know who you're supposed to marry. I don't know whether or not you're supposed to take the job in another state. I don't know whether or not you're supposed to come let your sister live with you. I don't know whether or not you try to adopt the foster kid. I don't know if you take the raise, even though it means you're going to be away from home more. I I don't know. You don't either. But the Holy Ghost knows. And so Paul said in Romans 8, we don't know what to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit himself intercedes with groanings that cannot be uttered. So I come up on these forks in the road in life and nobody externally can make that decision for me. It has to be made internally. How do I know what to do? Here we go, ready? 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. 1 Corinthians 14. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks. There it is. Everything hidden is revealed by the Holy Ghost. God can't move till something is spoken. And only the Holy Spirit knows what's in the mind of God. So God takes, the Holy Spirit takes mysteries from the mind of God and tucks them away in a mystery language. We used to think that the reason for the Holy Spirit was so that we could speak in tongues. It's not about tongues. It's about your future. Tongues was never meant for a climactic emotional experience with God. God gave you a heavenly prayer language because when you pray in the Holy Ghost, you are speaking the wisdom of God out of your mouth that is hidden in a mystery that only God knows. The Bible says it's unfruitful to your mind and the Bible says nobody around you understands it. But when you pray in a tongue, you utter mysteries. So everything that you need to know that you don't know, you are speaking when you pray in the Holy Ghost. The mysteries of God are revealed internally through your individual prayer language. Are you understanding what I'm saying tonight? When do I speak the wisdom of God hidden in a mystery? For when one speaks in a tongue, no one understands him. He doesn't speak to men, but he speaks to God. For in the spirit he utters, or King James, he uttereth mysteries. So what God has done 
is he's understanding that he has given you a language that he sees something has to be spoken for God to work. But he don't want you to speak in your known tongue because your enemy knows your known tongue. So the enemy who knows your known tongue, when you begin to pray, he can come to sabotage. He can come to roadblock. He can come with giants. He can come with obstacles. He can come with mountains. But when you begin to pray in the Holy Ghost, all the demon forces of darkness become frustrated because they're turning around. Satan said, what's he saying? What's he saying? I don't know what he's saying. Somebody tell me what he's saying. He's back over in them mysteries because you're now speaking something that only heaven knows about your life. You are speaking out of your mouth the mysteries that came out of the mind of God. Did you have any idea when you pray in the Holy Ghost, you are opening up room for God to move in your future and everything that's already been prepared for you, God begins to let you walk right into it. Things that have been in the heavenly places begin to drop into your life right at the right time. You meet the right people, you do the right things, you end up at the right place. Somebody shout hallelujah. Ooh, blessed be the name of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, I got one more scripture. If you'll let me break it down. According to pastor, I got a few more minutes. Let's go to the book nobody even knows exists. Let's go to the one called Jude. It's so small, it don't even have a chapter. <laughs> it's just Jude verse 20. See, folks, Solomon, hundreds of years before Jesus, said God puts eternity Even Solomon caught a revelation that there would be a day where something heavenly would move out of eternity and come into time and live inside of us. And he said, this eternity, what has been, has been, and this eternity, what is yet to be, has been. This thing that's gonna live inside of you, don't know time. Everything is past tense. The Holy Spirit has already gone in the mind of God and toured your life and come back to be your tour guide. I have never understood a pastor that says, I want to help everybody reach their potential and don't tell them about the Holy Ghost. That is, that is biblical heresy. It is, it is, a, it is a contradiction. Because your future is revealed by the Holy Spirit. If you, don't, if you don't get acquainted with the Holy Ghost, then the only way you know how to learn is to fail. I don't have time for the only way I, I learn how to advance is through a failure because I spend all my anointing picking up pieces. I don't want to spend all my energy and all my anointing cleaning up mistakes. When I don't know what to pray, I don't want to guess. When I don't know what to do, I, won't, I don't want to guess. I want to read by And when I begin to pray, all of a sudden the wisdom of God begins to flow out of my mouth. And all of a sudden I see somebody I didn't know I was going to see. And I get something I didn't know I was going to get. And I'm in somebody's path that I didn't know I was going to cross. And an opportunity came that I didn't know was going to come. And I walked through a door that I didn't even know was going to present itself. And what was happening? Because the whole time you was unleashing heaven to drop things that had been planned in eternity to move into your life and I'm telling you there is a purpose now that we need the Holy Spirit like never before because while the future seems so uncertain to so many people the people of God can rise up and say I take no thought about tomorrow what I'm going to eat hey, or what I'm going to drink for the Father knows what I need even before I ask hey, and he told the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit lives in <laughs> Woo, this is a good night. I'm feeling this thing. 
Jude, verse 20. Okay, I'm going to read it this time, I promise. <laughs> but you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Look at what God called this. Yo, I could go on and on. What is the anointing? The anointing is the Holy Ghost coming and living on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in bodily form like a dove, and then Jesus walked into the temple, opened the scrolls, and said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me too, and then he started laying it out. The anointing is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what 1 John 2.20 says? You have an anointing, and you know all things. It didn't say you know all things in your mind. But he has put eternity in their hearts. As Solomon, hundreds of, years, hundreds of years later, you have an anointing and you don't realize it, but in your spirit, you know everything. <laughs> your mind is trying to catch up with what your spirit already knows. Come on. Have you ever been sitting with somebody in church? Can I, can I sit right here? Have you ever been sitting with somebody in church and a preacher been preaching and the person beside you just let out one of them spontaneous shouts and almost scares you? you ever had, do they do that in California? They do it in South Carolina all the time. You'd be sitting right here and all of a sudden somebody's preaching, whoo, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And you're sitting there going, I didn't feel that. What did they just feel? I didn't feel. I didn't. If you ask that person, they don't know what happened. All they know is their spirit jumped on something he said because their spirit knew it had to do with their future even though that person's mind don't even know what's going on yet. And so that person spiritually had to respond to what came out of the man of God even though in their mind they don't even sure they know what happened yet. A lot of times I'm, I'm shouting and running about things that I have no idea in my mind what God's going to do but I just felt something in my spirit leap like a baby jumping up and down in me and you got to understand that there's sometimes your head don't have a clue what to do but in your spirit there is a confidence that you're headed in the right direction and I came to talk to the people who know that you have an anointing and if you can tap into your anointing you won't miss God hallelujah <laughs> building yourself up in the most you have holy you have more holy but you can't increase on most When you get to most, you've tapped it out. Do you know what Jude described as the highest level of faith you can walk in? Not believing to get out of a wheelchair, not believing for a million dollars. Uh -uh. He said the highest level of faith you can walk in is when you are saying things you don't know to a God you can't see for a future that is unclear, expecting mysteries to take place. <laughs> you can't increase on that kind of... In other words, people that come to God in use of their prayer language, you are operating at the pinnacle of faith because you don't even know what you're praying, but you're trusting that God's taking care of it anyway. It is the highest level of trust because you're saying things you don't even know what they mean. And you're trusting God that you are praying your future into existence that you are speaking the wisdom of God tucked away in a mystery, not hidden from you, but hidden for you. Hallelujah. Play something if you would, Brother Terrence. Pastor, may, may I close ministering to some people? I know what time it is. I'll be mindful of that. 
pastor told me that this would be a normally a time of Bible study. <clears throat> so this is one of those ones where you got to take your time and kind of lay it out. You can't just blast away and be through. You got to you got to tie it together. <clears throat> I'm going all the way from Ecclesiastes to Jude. There's a lot of knots to tie up. <clears throat> this may only touch a small group of people. I was content to come tonight and teach and make the deposit of the word of God and then just, just end. But when I get to this point, I have to feel it out and see what God's putting in me. <clears throat> I want to end with an opportunity for a certain group of people and then I'll hand the mic back to Pastor. I'm not going to tarry. I'm not going to take long. I do respect the fact that everybody works hard. I work hard. I know I need a night's rest like everybody else. <clears throat> Having said that, I need to allow a moment for the Holy Spirit to move for some people who are in a real fork in the road. I'm not talking about whether or not to go to McDonald's or Burger King. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about there, there are people, and it, it's, it's not, you know, I don't know that it's hundreds. It might be 11. It might be 50. I don't know. You are right now in a life altering decision in other words you will choose a course and that course will take you down a path I feel like the Holy Spirit is showing me there's some of you that are afraid I feel like there's even more of you that are confused that you feel like you lack answers I hear the Holy Spirit telling me right now that you've gone around and tried to seek other people's wisdom and you've come away with nothing. You know why? Because no eye has seen. You went to the wrong counselor. You went to the wrong guide. They're good. But this is something that's got to happen internally, not externally. <clears throat> I mean, you're, you're at that place. You're at... You're, you're at a, I even hear the word defining moment in my spirit. And so you don't have a defining moment every Thursday. You may only have four or five in your whole life. But I believe I'm here tonight on a Wednesday night. When I was first coming, it was just for Friday. And Pastor said, won't you just preach on Wednesday too? I said, would love to. I'm here to let everybody have the information I just shared. But there's a few people. You are facing a moment that will set a course for a future. And you're confused and you're lost about what God would have you to do. And this is a moment tonight in prayer around this altar where God is gonna release some things and all of a sudden you're gonna get a rest that the peace of God is guarding your heart and mind and that you're doing the right thing. That's why I preach tonight. Without heads bowed and eyes closed, we ain't hiding nothing. We ain't ashamed of nothing. We, we're the body of Christ. We pulling for each other. If that's you, come up here with me if you would. Who are you? Come up here with me. <clears throat> if y'all want to move this podium, you're welcome to. You're welcome to. <clears throat> Just come up here and stand around this altar with me. Come up here close to me. I don't know what's normal, but you, you can come up here and get close to me. We don't have to do the 10 feet rule. <clears throat> wow, this many? Wow. Till everybody comes. Don't miss out on that. I got to be honest with you, there's a lot more people than I thought. I thought it might be 20 or 30.
I hear the Lord telling me to say to you, he knows exactly where you are. Lord said, you're not off course. I heard the Lord say, he's going to comfort you in these next few moments and take the fear away. That's all right. You can do that here. You ain't got to hold it back. You're in a safe place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I feel his presence. Thank you, Lord. Somebody's saying, what you, when you going to pray? I just, I'm letting him work. He's already working right now. I can see it. Would you just stand there in his presence a minute and just let him comfort you? Anxiety, Lord. Break the insomnia. Feel like your mind's on fire. Oh, God's going to give you rest. I hear the Lord saying, Tell him I'm going to lead him. Don't worry, I'm leading him. I'm not behind you. I'm in front of you. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, I thank you, Lord. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Right there, would you just raise your hands and worship in Jesus, Jesus. Feel him in this moment flushing. Flushing your fear out. Flushing your anxiety out. Feel him when you, when you raise your hand. Feel his presence. Unclogging the pipes of your ability to hear God. I hear the Lord telling me right now, I said, trust your relationship with Him. You don't trust that you feel like I'm, I'm, I'm off course and, and I've been too busy and I haven't given you. And, and what God said, trust your relationship with me. I'm still right there. I'm still right there. I have not left. I am still right there. I'm standing in your tomorrow and calling you into it, says the Lord. I feel the Spirit of God moving right now in this place. Those of you watching online, those of you watching online, there are many of you, this is for you tonight. This is for you tonight too. I don't know how many of you are. This ain't a time to feel bad if you're not. This is not an exclusive group. But I'm going to release us just a moment to pray. <clears throat> Everyone individually. This is not the gift where it's said to the whole church and has to have an interpreter. This is your personal heavenly prayer language. And those of you that have never experienced it, in the next few minutes, I believe that you're going to just begin speaking in the Holy Ghost right there if you'll just ask God say God I want to know you like that I want you to feel me like that I want to be able to speak my future like that God is going to fill you with his spirit right here in this moment on the count of three I want your hands to go up and those of you that know him that way begin to release your heavenly prayer language and God is about to move and open doors and move you right into your perfect future. No mistake will be made. You will open the correct door, says the Lord. One, two. Come on, just begin to pray to the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Yeah, Brother Sal, man, just raise that keyboard up. Fill this room with that sound. Fill that room. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anybody in this room, it's for you right now. If you don't know God that way, it's for you right now. If you don't know Him, it's for you right now. Just lift your hands. He'll feel you right now. Say, feel me, Holy Spirit, and you'll begin to pray. It may be just a syllable. It may be just a word. It may be just a phrase. You say, well, I don't understand it. You're not supposed to understand it. God understands it. God is the one that understands it. I feel the Spirit of God moving in this place. Oh, uncertainty is leaving your life. Peace is coming. Peace is coming. Peace is coming. Peace is, peace is coming. Peace is coming in the name of Jesus. Rest is coming in the name of Jesus. You're going to see clearly now in the name of Jesus. Come on, just a little bit longer. Push just a little bit longer. This is an important night. This is an important moment. This is an important moment. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Father, for the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel the Spirit of God moving. Come, Holy Ghost. Come, Holy Ghost. Feel, feel, feel now. Feel, feel those who are empty. Feel those who don't know you in this way. Feel those who hunger. Feel those who thirst. Feel those who want to seek the kingdom of God and His right. Feel, feel, feel in the name of Jesus. I believe in you to do it. Pastor, if you would, you can come on up here with me. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Pray. That's not the gift. That's her personal prayer language. Let her pray. Let her pray. <laughs> Let her pray. If it needed to be interpreted, I would know it. It don't need it. It's her language. This is a breakthrough happening right here. I'm telling you, this is a powerful moment right here. If you could see in the spirit realm what is happening over this place right now, if you could see what's happening over your head, you are opening doors that have already been prepared for you. You're gonna walk into futures that have already been prepared for you. There are blessings that have been held up waiting on this moment. I hear the Holy Ghost saying blessings that have been held up. They've been there with your name on them the whole time, but they have been held up for this moment. It was never about the tongue. It was about the mystery. The mystery. But it's a mystery no more. For in the Spirit, we have uttered mysteries. <laughs> 